Recovery in some commodity markets, and uh, Jerry Gidell is ready to explain you why. Right here on Connected Farmer, your channel to keep you up to date with the latest trends in agriculture and livestock. So Jerry, how are you? We have I don't I don't want to use the word shaky, but uh, we had a volatile markets this week. Uh, particularly corn, uh, we have some uh, changing movements, and uh, soybean uh, had uh, rebounded on Friday as well. How can you explain uh, all that? What do you what's uh, the main thing in these markets? Well, uh, this this week really was hopefully a transitional week. We've had eight or nine, ten weeks down in some of the uh, corn and soybeans in here, and that I think there's a combination of uh, uh, of uh, people deciding that uh, uh, that once the March uh, futures are really going off the board, and first notice day this week was uh, on Thursday, and then uh, so. Uh, and also the fact that uh, that uh, some of the trends we've seen recently in uh, in uh, in uh, South American prospects to, don't look as, as strong as they uh, have. The USDA uh, kind of punted on some of their numbers last month, so we'll see if they make adjustments there. But in general, we did see uh, the, the corn kind of finally get a little spunk into it here. Uh, in that, uh, and, and then the soybeans uh, did a kind of nice sideways action there and, and did recover on Friday. Uh, interesting, the last couple days here in soybeans, the first day of notices we had uh, uh, cargo put out their uh, hedge receipts they had over the January to March period. And then uh, on Friday, uh, Bungie, uh, came in and took two half to two thirds of those uh, on their side. So that sign suggests that the commercials in the soybean world have decided that uh, at least uh, somebody thinks it's worthy of owning. So uh, I think that was a real positive here psychologically, and I think it helped that little that late rally on Friday uh, to uh, a core. Also, just the uncertainties of of. Uh, what could happen with the USDA's numbers uh, a week, uh, well, on March 8th at this week. So uh, I think that was part of the uh, factor. And to some extent, uh, uh, there's lots of uncertainty, both in South American production situations uh, and that. Uh, and so, uh, and ongoing issues in the Mideast and, and Black Sea is also floating around in here. So I think there was a, uh, well, I think that the, there's no reason to keep pounding this market like they have uh, for most of uh, uh, 2024. Yeah, on the South American issue, I want to jump in. In that, we had uh, Stonex uh, increasing the, the Brazilian soybean output, and that coincides uh, with another opinion from down there. Uh, an analyst uh, has said recently that uh, the reason uh, the soybean prices went down recently were because that the Brazilian uh, soybean crop won't be an, as bad as expected and uh, the, the Argentinian soybean crop will be uh, big enough. Yeah, that, that's been a theory that's been kind of floating along in here uh, from that standpoint. I, the, the twist of it is, is that the uh, reports that we're still getting from the major producing areas, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso del Sol, Paranon, things like that, uh, not so not, uh, not that solid of numbers at this point. Actually, they're talking about the 10 to 15 percent off year over year yields, and that's pretty significant. And those are the uh, along with Goya's, uh, is uh, the real four major uh, producers. Uh, of course, Rio Grande's in there too. Uh, but I think that the, the interesting twist, and I think it, the reason this person was pointing to was the north 
northern northeastern provinces, Tucumcan, Khan, uh, uh, Biafra, uh, other ones up that direction. They did not get a lot of plantings in this year early because of the dryness uh, and that, and it has improved uh, uh, in the northern areas. But those are not your primary areas. Now, I, I know there is a chance they could help us help uh, Brazil in their output. I wonder, though, if it's going to be a huge turnaround uh, at this point. Uh, you know, actually, I think the the stone axe number was up about a million metric tons uh, and that. And uh, I guess the, the real interesting thing is where do we start? Do we start below 150 in this year's uh, Brazilian crop or did we start at 150 as what the stone axe people were looking? They do have quite a, uh, an area of uh, expertise. They're down in Brazil. Uh, they've been there for decades. Actually, I think they've been there since 30 and 40 years, that particular organization. So they do have some uh, knowledge there, but I guess I'd have to be a little surprised if we have a rising number from the USDA because they're way up there at 156 on their soybean number uh, from there. And at this point, uh, last month, the uh, USDA did slip their number down to 124 uh, on uh, corn output. And I kind of feel like that should slide a little bit this coming month uh, to 121, uh, maybe 120 uh, from there uh, because of the, uh, basically the uh, uh, lateness and uh, and actually some uh, reduced plantings. We've heard all kinds of ideas that some of this thing has been switched over to cotton. Some of it's uh, didn't get planted at all. And so, uh, that's still not down to the some of the rock bottom ideas of 116, 118 uh, on corn. On the soybean side, uh, the there's still people in this 145, 147 zone. Uh, so we've still got lots of ideas about what both uh, uh, Brazil's uh, corn and and uh, soybean output will be for 2024. But I think that's really the biggest thing we're going to be looking at here uh, uh, next Friday is uh, what uh, happens with the USDA's estimates for South America uh, at this point. The U.S. numbers are likely to have modest changes. Or none. Yes. And we also had the updated uh, export numbers this week. How did you see those? Well, uh, the uh, the numbers that we saw here on soybeans uh, were uh, just a smidgen less than uh, uh, the trade average estimate, and the trade average estimate was really at record uh, near record levels. We've had uh, the pace September through December was new record. Uh, a crush, I'm sorry. These are crush statistics. That's the one that came out uh, accordingly, not uh, exports. Uh, and then it was a solid number. Don't, don't let me go. It's It was talking one and one and a half less than the trade average estimates in that. And, and the other uh, thing that came out on Friday, which was uh, the uh, uh, thing that uh, has been people looking at is what was the impact of this cold weather in the U.S.? And we uh, definitely saw it on the weekly out, uh, uh, outputs of uh, U.S. ethanol in that. Because ethanol, interestingly, is not a continuous flow type of process like uh, uh, soybean processing is. Uh, you put it in one end, you run it through different procedures, and then, then once you get it kind of uh, uh, move through the process at the end, you separate the oil from the meal and, and then you end up, uh, you know, go from there. It, the, uh, uh, corn scenarios, uh, you run in a batch, do the scenario, uh, then, uh, start over again. So that's been, uh, that one came in just a little bit less. So in general, the domestic side of our U S process, uh, was, uh, on monthly numbers for January, we're just a tad uh, lower than expected. So I kind of feel like that I was kind of anticipating really that uh, those numbers would be, uh, like you say, a near record or a little bit above uh, the process for those months. And that, so uh, it wasn't the case. Uh, our general exports that you mentioned there, 
uh, we've uh, had some very kind of ongoing solid corn numbers here as uh, basically uh, South America is uh, switching their output towards soybeans uh, and that with their harvest going on. And so uh, it's been kind of the trend that's occurred here, uh, <laughs> excuse me, over the last four, four, five, six years is that the U.S. corn exports are kind of modest in the fall, and then they really pick up during this period when Brazil is uh, concentrating uh, and on shipping uh, soybeans. So uh, that's uh, looking uh, pretty solid. We're about 250 million ahead of uh, the pace we should be at, or ahead of last year's pace, I should say. And I think we're really close to the ongoing thing, so I don't see a lot of changes there. On the soybeans, there's been a little disappointment. Primarily, just talked about the South Americans uh, concentrating on beans. And uh, the last few weeks here, our sales uh, on beans have only been like two and a half and, and five or five and a half uh, million bushels, which uh, makes you a little uh, knock need here on the exports on beans. But I kind of feel like that if this numbers here on output in uh, Brazil, because of the dryness they've had, because of the uh, issues that have occurred uh, in that area, that the production could be slipping, and that I kind of feel like that we're going to still be able to uh, hit the USDA's numbers because we are dealing with a small uh, export outlook because of last year's crop. So uh, I kind of feel like that uh, that's still uh, going to hang in there. But that could be an interesting one. They took off uh, 35 million last month on U.S. exports of uh, soybeans because of this. Uh, uh, building uh, export prospects. And I think at, at the time, too, I think there was uh, some expectations that uh, that uh, Argentina's exports could be uh, on the stronger side with lots of people talking about their crop maybe being a lot closer to 54, 55 million versus the 52 that many had. And the USDA didn't even go up from their 50 million last month. So interesting scenario on the on the. South American soybeans, I still feel like that uh, that 315 million number that's probably going to be the same this month uh, on carryover stock for the U.S. could still slip down uh, oh, closer to 280, maybe even less than that. Now, that's not like, wow, I got to feel like I go to the moon on it, but uh, I do feel that, uh, that uh, seasonally that could help us uh, move a little bit higher in, uh, in uh, soybean values here. Because uh, I really, I don't see there's any desire from producers to uh, sell, uh, you know, beans, cash beans below 11 bucks. All right. And they also, uh, we have seen some reports that uh, some uh, shipments of soybeans will, will come in the nearer future from Brazil to the United States. Yes, that's been an ongoing rumor that's popped up a couple times here. It, it popped up again uh, just early last week. Uh, from there, uh, it's involving uh, the East Coast poultry people uh, in that, uh, and uh, the it's I don't just disagree that there might be a couple cargos or maybe three or something like that. I don't see that's a big. Uh, over uh, and to some extent, the one that happened this week, I think, was a, a indication of, of a previous talk and previous indications that some beans were going to be moving from uh, the Amazon up to the East Coast. Uh, this prospects of uh, beans going all the way from uh, Paranagua or uh, down in the southern parts of the U.S., but taking that boat all the way up isn't really the logical thing that you know break even on stuff from there. So that's uh, it's out there. I don't sense that it's going to be a huge uh, train of uh, movement back and forth, or excuse me, boat movement uh, between the two countries. But uh, the uh, East Coast uh, uh, poultry raisers kind of like to kick the. Uh, the soybean and soybean meal market and then shins every once in a while and they've done that again this year we all and the the issue you have mentioned with the geopolitical context 
is that uh, Russia is not showing any will to extend the Red Sea deal, and that uh, will generate a significant impact on the wheat markets, I guess. Well, you know, that's the the scenario here at this point. The wheat market, uh, wow, it had a big tumble on Friday there. Uh, 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 maybe that report was in there. I think the the, the general scenario was is that uh, that um, that uh, one of the uh, delivery uh, situations kind of popped back up there. It wasn't big, but it was some uh, on that. But in general, the uh, uh, we've had ongoing issues back and forth here about. Uh, the European Commission is, is a lot more receptive of having grain move across their borders into various exports facilities, while the Poles and others have been uh, feeling like everything that comes across the border has got to be negative to their price. Well, unfortunately, that's not always the case, but that's how the perception is uh, out there uh, uh, in Eastern Europe and that, that the, all this movement, uh, it, which can't go down through. And by the way, uh, this last month's uh, February Black Sea shipments was their best that they've had since everything has went down last summer on this whole agreement that we talked about. Uh, you mentioned earlier that the Russians aren't excited about extending. And so uh, to some extent, uh, uh, the Ukrainians and uh, and the others in the Eastern uh, side of the European uh, Union have really uh, moved a lot of stuff. So uh, that's part of it. I think uh, there's some talk about uh, U.S. rain uh, prospects picking up here. Uh, that definitely is a huge factor here in the U.S. Uh, uh, we've had, uh, uh, you know, generally speaking, a very dry, less snowy situation in the central U.S. It's not the case in the West Coast. They seem to have really blasted that place. Uh, big time, which they need uh, uh, that type of stuff for the reservoirs and that. But in the central U.S., there hasn't been the kind of moisture that it has. It seems like it bounces over there and it hits the East Coast, as you guys have seen at times. So uh, anyway, I think the wheat market, uh, that was the one disappointing factor we had this week was is that the wheat market struggled a little bit. I kind of feel like, though, that... Uh, that particular market uh, still has a lot of uncertainty, and and hopefully uh, we get it kind of stabilized and, and, and get into a spring kind of uh, trend, which is uh, uh, looking at the U.S. crop prospects and uh, things like that. Oh, one last thing, a kind of controversy in this wheat that I just kind of flashed is the fact that uh, lots of different opinion as to where India's uh, prospects for the coming uh April harvest is going to be uh, right now. They've been in this kind of 113, 114 top side of production down to 110 over the last three or four years. Uh, even the <laughs> couple different people uh, referenced the thing from the fact that maybe we're down 2 million uh, from uh, the uh, early expectations at 112 and other people saying, well, we're up from 112 from last year's 110. Uh, in general, that's a very important area out there uh, on U.S. Uh, and world pieces, world uh, wheat prices. This is what does India do? Uh, they definitely have strained their uh, stocks uh, trying to keep their prices down out there. So I'd suspect if they have another strain, uh, another, let's say, 110 or less, they could easily be back in the world markets, and that could definitely sop up some of this excess uh, wheat that's floating around out here because of uh, various things in the in the transportation and weather and everything else. So anyway, right now, at least, uh, kind of feel like we stabilized some things out. Uh, hopefully that continues. Maybe we actually end up uh, seeing uh, some tightness in the world numbers here from the USDA next uh, week. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, we start to kind of concentrate here on uh, the fact that, uh, that um, our uh, 
U.S. Uh, demand has been so solid domestically. Hopefully, uh, the uh, little hiccup we've had here in the beans kind of picks up in the in the export world, uh, and that uh, because of maybe reduced su supplies down in Bo in Brazil. But anyway, it's uh, another uh, choppy week, but it, potentially maybe it's a transition. All right. Thank you very much, sir. You bet. Take care. And we'll talk next week.